Welcome to Future Proofing, Building a Resilient Organization. I am Julian Birkinshaw. I'm a professor of strategy and entrepreneurship at the London Business School, and I am your chair for this live webinar. It is brought to you by CI&T, which is a digital company. They provide strategy design technology services to global companies around the world, including Johnson & Johnson, BlackRock, Coca-Cola, and others. CIT has been around for about 25 years and has about 3,000 employees across the globe. Today we have three speakers as well as myself and I'm just going to briefly introduce each of them. First of all, Bruno Giacardi, who is co-founder and president of CIT. Um, let me uh, introduce Bruno. Perhaps you'd just like to say a few words of introduction. Hi, Julian. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with you guys. And, uh, just want to say that we're very excited to 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 talk about resilience and and agility and ways to tackle uncertainty, uh, which is something that we've been doing, you know, for in our entire life in the digital space, where those things are reality for much uh, uh, way longer than we're facing now, right? So, so that's the motivation for for this uh, for this uh, reunion here. Cool. Thanks. Uh, next up, Kareem Hussein, who is the Chief of Staff in Barclays Private Bank and has had a number of other senior roles in that company. Kareem, just a couple of words about yourself and and, and your thoughts on the, on the challenges ahead. Sure. Um, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone, wherever you are. Uh, a real privilege to be part of this webinar. I work as Chief of Staff for the part of Barclays that offers banking, credit and investment services to wealthy individuals uh, in a nutshell. Part of my role means I'm responsible for everything you'd think a chief of staff is responsible for, but I also oversee various strategic and transformational activities as well as brand and marketing. Um, very excited to talk about resilience today. It's extremely high up in my mind right now. Um, incredible changes happening across all industries, including ours in financial services. So a lot to think about in terms of how we adjust our business models and move forward successfully. Perfect. Thanks, Kareem. And finally, Ben Galloway, who is the uh, Chief Director of Strategy and Insights at Coca-Cola, a company that needs no introduction. Ben, a couple of thoughts about your role and the challenges facing Coca-Cola? Thanks, Julian. Likewise, delighted to be here. Yes, I look after Strategy and Insight for a chunk of Coke in Europe, so I look after Great Britain, Ireland and Northern Europe. So that means that really my job is about helping Coca-Cola and our bottling partners on managing current performance, but also helping our leadership understand how the market and consumers are evolving and using that to help shape the strategy and planning that we have across our markets. So right now, a big part of the job is definitely about what's happening with the current crisis and responding to the market and competitive changes which we're seeing happening as part of it. It means right now that a lot of my time is spent looking at replanning on the year to go and also looking forward to 2021 and what the new normal might bring. So as you can imagine, means that right now, very broad changes to our business, um, especially when you're thinking about the type of business we have in, in channels like hotels, pubs and restaurants, where we're really seeing an impact, but also with consumers living and working at home and therefore changing their behaviours around it. So like Karim, really relevant topic that we're talking about today. Really excited to be getting into it with you. Perfect. Thanks. So I'm going to um, share a couple of thoughts. Let me just tell you a little bit about how we're going to run the session. First of all, you should all be able to now, I believe, see my screen. Um, and this reminds you of a couple of things. First of all, uh, in terms of timing, this is going to be a one hour session, roughly 40 minutes of this session will be the four of us talking, uh, but we are encouraging questions throughout. So what will happen is that if you ask questions using the question drop down menu on the control panel, uh, we've got a team of people who are going to be curating those questions and feeding them to us so that I can then ask them to the audience in the latter parts of the session. So that is the, the structure of the, of the session. I'm going to now spend about six or seven minutes just sort of sketching out what I see this is the, is the sort of the challenge that big companies and indeed smaller companies are facing right now. And that will also set up the structure for the session. And so this first slide you see here, um, this is a slide many of us, myself included, have made at various times in our lives as planners, as 
as business heads, we always see the world getting you know, gradually better. Whatever the nature of that opportunity, we'd always like to believe it. it's getting um, more promising. Uh, we'll typically do some sensitivity analysis around whatever numbers, whether they're revenue or profit numbers, to show that we recognize that the world is not completely stable. But this sort of predictable kind of scenario of the future is, is almost implicit in most of our planning processes. And of course, you don't need to tell me to tell you that that is not how the world works today. Arguably, it never worked in that way, but certainly in today's pandemic hit world, it is as true, more true than it's ever been, that the world in practice is actually a little bit like this. In other words, we see uh, these sudden death threats to our business, uh, the pandemic, but you can also go back to the financial crisis of 2008-10, you can go back to 9-11, I mean, we can see these crises every decade or so, but fortunately there's also opportunities and there's many instances out there that you've all experienced where suddenly an opportunity to buy a company appeared out of nowhere, sometimes a big new digital technology emerges that gives you an opportunity to grow your business dramatically. And the point is that you can never tell when these spikes, whether they're positive spikes or negative spikes, will happen, but you do know for sure that they will happen. And the point is that how we prepare for this reality, rather than the kind of stable reality that we kind of implicitly assumed, that is the big challenge of our times. And a lot of you are very familiar with this notion of agility. Either agility is a very kind of generic concept of being able to move quickly and easily, or sometimes agility in terms of, of sort of agile system development. Anyone who's in the world of software development knows agile as a methodology for developing computer systems, which is deliberately a little bit more iterative and more fast moving. I want to put the case to you that actually agility is not irrelevant today, but in some ways resilience is even more important. And resilience is simply put, of course, the capacity of any sort of system to absorb disturbance and still remain able to function. And you see those images at the bottom, you see the tree on the bottom right trying to you know, put down its roots into a soil which doesn't exist. It turns out that a lot of natural systems are incredibly resilient to all sorts of weather and nature events which can't be planned. And the image in the bottom left is just a, an image from a a flood a few years ago, trying to make the point that in fact human systems are pretty resilient. I mean, of course, we take a knock, but we can often find a way out of that problem by, by whatever course of action helps us to survive. We are survivors. So we need resilience, we also need agility. And I think one of the things we want to play out today is that not always the case that agility and resilience are the same things. Uh, agility, let me just make the point in the following way, go back to the financial crisis, go back to that era which we all remember quite well. Before 2008, you know, the big guys on Wall Street, of course, were Merrill Lynch, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, the so-called broker dealers. As soon as that crisis hit, it became apparent that while those companies were hugely agile, very good at running after new opportunities, they were really not very resilient. And indeed, they had to convert themselves. If you recall, Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley converted themselves to bank holding companies in order to have the regulatory kind of assistance uh, from the government in order to be able to take deposits. Uh, and the other broker dealers disappeared. Merrill Lynch was sold to Bank of America and so forth. It turned out that Chase Manhattan, Citibank, Bank of America were much more resilient and of course, less agile. That didn't mean that they were able to grab all the opportunities on the upside, but they were much better positioned on the downside. So I want us to think over this next 45, 50 minutes or so about what exactly resilience looks like. It's particularly acute as an issue right now, but it's arguably gonna be a big part of our planning as we move forward. And I think it's useful to play out resilience at three levels. And this is gonna be the structure of the rest of the of the session actually, we're gonna talk first of all about operational resilience, what it is that we have to do to keep our core operations going. All of us are going through this process of thinking through our liquidity, making sure we've got capacity and emergency planning systems in place to get us through the worst of this downturn. But then as we start looking forward, we've got to think about, I think really about two other forms of resilience. Uh, the first 
of those two is strategic resilience, which is this ability to not just survive today, but to survive and thrive as the world changes, to be able to respond as customer demand, as technological threats evolve. What are the things that allow us to make our strategy much more resilient? And the third one is what I think of in terms of of the sort of the, the organization and the people inside that organization, the personal resilience that they need in order to be able to withstand shocks. And just very briefly, I'm going to spend 30 seconds on each of those before I then open up for the discussion with the other panelists. If we take operational resilience first, for me, the big transition that we've got to get our heads around is that in some ways we spent you know, many decades perfecting lean supply, lean manufacturing systems, where we got rid of inventory as much as possible. We made our systems as perfectly balanced as possible, assuming predictable supply. And of course, nowadays, when we've suddenly got these huge disruptions to our supply, uh, we now have to think in terms of building redundancy, building diversity into our systems to make them operationally resilient. And that's a very, very different set of choices than the ones that we perfected in a world of predictable supply and indeed no barriers between trade between many parts of the world. The second strategic resilience is about the shift from developing a strategic plan where you can think several steps ahead to one built around making sense of what I like to think of as the fog of the future. I stole that phrase from a friend and colleague, Don Sull. And that involves scenario planning. It involves developing real options on what we need to do next. And very, very different tools are involved there. So that's the second form of strategic, of strategic resilience. And then the third, organizational and personal resilience. You know, a lot of that is about rethinking the way that we build our organizations much less emphasis on traditional alignment and formal structures and having everything kind of mapped out from the top down a much greater emphasis on a fluidity of structure and an emphasis on giving people individual accountability and choice over what they do typically giving people much more personal responsibility is a good way actually of building both resilience and agility so that was a quick run through of the three levels of agility, of, of resilience and the kind of tradition, the transition that we need to make as we start to take them much more seriously. So I'm now going to stop sharing my slides and I'm now going to bring in our three panelists and I'm going to structure it in the way that I just said. Let's take operational resilience first. So if I'm going to turn, I think, to probably um, Ben first, if that's OK. Um, what is Coca-Cola doing to ensure the resilience of its existing operations, its supply chain, its manufacturing, its relationships with its customers? Absolutely. That's a really good question, Julian. Something which the last six, eight weeks we've been working through as a business. I think you know, you're exactly right that it's really understanding where you need to flex and how you need to flex. It's also about prioritization. Because if I think back to us as a FMCG company, you know, it really comes back to what consumers are doing and understanding what their needs are and understanding therefore what we need to change internally um, and make sure that we're building the right resilience and flexibility. So if I think about what I'm seeing in my industry, the first is consumers are changing how they shop. So they're buying bigger baskets and they're shopping less often. If I put some numbers around that, I think you'd say that baskets, so how much people are purchasing on a trip, increasing by almost 40%. And we're visiting shops probably about 25% less. So if you think about your usual pre-COVID approach to shopping, you'd probably pop into your local supermarket a few times a week, top up during the week. Obviously, that's not happening right now because people are trying to stay indoors. And it's also changing where they shop as well. So as you'd expect, online sales have really boomed. They've increased by about 10%, probably about 10% of sales now. Uh, we're previously they were sitting at around 7%. So you think, oh, it's not that much. Actually, that's an increase of over 30%. And the, the reason why that's increased is obvious, but actually it should be increasing more. And it's a reflection that actually online grocery doesn't have the capacity to meet the current demand. So you can see there that that's where potentially you'd say that the groceries 
haven't been as flexible and resilient with the way they've built their operations because they didn't expect this kind of expansion and demand. But certainly as a FMCG company, we're seeing that and also changes the products and the way that we sell and making sure we dial that up rather than necessarily changing everything. And have you had capacity um, problems? I'm sorry, have you had problems in getting your your Coca-Cola products to the groceries in time? Have there been stockouts? Not for us, no. So we're quite lucky in that way. So the way that the grocery supply chain tends to work is that as a large supplier, we ship into a central warehouse for a large retailer like Tesco, and then Tesco then sends it out to their stores. With most of our products, we've been quite lucky because a lot of them are quite high rotation and high demand, and so it's been easier to move them through. Uh, I think where you see things being tested is um, where you don't have multiple points where you can manufacture, and if you're unlucky and you don't build in that resilience across your infrastructure, so if one manufacturing plant goes down, then your whole supply is locked up. Yeah. But thankfully, we haven't experienced that, and actually it's been counter to that, that we've actually been able to help some of the grocers yeah. uh, with the way that we've supplied, which is we've been quite lucky with. Cool. Uh, I guess the other consideration is also the products as well. So some of the grocers, for example, might ask to rationalise down what you're offering, so it's easy for them to manage. And so that's a point where, as a supplier, we might be working more closely with yes. them. Okay, so I want to bring Kareem, because obviously, you know, Banking is very different to Coca-Cola, and private banking is even more different than, shall we say, retail banking. Tell us a little bit about how you have been building the operational resilience, keeping things going over the last two months. So, so first of all, I'll set the context a little bit. So we deal with clients who are the wealthiest individuals in society, and we deal with clients spread across the globe from different cultures, time zones, and so on. Our business model is heavily based on face-to-face -face interaction. There's always this analogy of a private banker sitting across the kitchen table from their client discussing their personal, their family, their business needs, and tailoring financial solutions to them. So suddenly we're left in an environment where we can't do that anymore. And in fact, the last thing an individual would want to do is have someone in their home, particularly a banker. <laughs> so how do we think about operational resilience? Well, first of all, we've had to very quickly embed culturally digital tools. So using things like WebEx or Zoom or other such tools to engage with clients hasn't really been a major part of our business model in the past. And embedding that with our own people as well as clients is super important. So that's the first step. The second piece is really what do clients need? So our clients, as you might expect, are extremely worried like everyone else about what's going on in the world. And what they require from us is partnership, trust and advice. And so when you think about the basic concept here, and that's really trust, how do we continue to deliver that to our clients even if we can't see them face to face? The answer is quite simple. Operationally, we have to take it back to basics in many ways. So how do we continue to engage with our clients and discuss with them their banking, their investments, their credit situations, talk to them about stress in their business, come up with innovative solutions to help them? We don't need to be face to face to do that. And so it's really, really peeling back the business model and thinking at its simplest, what does banking look like? And it's really that advisory model that is super, super important. And where we will stand apart from our competitors if we do this right is by being around the clients at the right time continuously throughout this situation as it evolves. I mean, in March, we saw stock markets plunge over 30%. Our clients, of course, like everyone else in the world are impacted and what they require from us is that support. The other piece is how do we add on other services which might be relevant. So an example would be we offer philanthropy services and advice. So how can we also start to show our clients again through basic means that we're able to partner with them through quite challenging decisions around charitable donations at a time where we know charities are really struggling and we know from the UK you know it could be up to 20% of charities see distress in the coming months and years. So really 
for us, it's been very much about taking it back to the basics. I think generally private banking has not seen the digitization that you'd see in other industries. So there's also this element where we very quickly had to do things like set up the ability for people in call centers to take calls from homes, to think about digital identification and signatures, things which would feel basic perhaps in retail banking, but don't currently exist in private banking. And so as we do that, there is stress on our business model. Yeah. And really what we can do again, if we keep it basic is there's plenty of tools, partners we can work with to digitize our client journeys. But what we have to do throughout all of this is set the right expectations with our clients and our colleagues. And setting those expectations has been key because if you do that, people are willing to wait a few more minutes or to engage with you through a different channel or to go a little bit through an extra bottleneck to get to the right outcome. And so a lot of what, what I'm seeing is really around just how do you continue to deliver the most fundable, fundamental aspects of banking uh, to the client? And, you know, that obviously means, you know, we've removed things like the entertainment side of, of private banking that, you know, is so stereotypically associated with it. Good. I mean, it is interesting to me as a, an observer of many industries. You've got some industries like Coca-Cola where you know, life goes on, not the same, but life goes on. I mean, you have built the systems which allow you to, to do all of these things when there's a shock. And whereas private banking and indeed my industry education, we have suddenly had to completely reinvent the means by which we do our business. You know, we, we have gone from face-to-face -face teaching to online. You had to persuade a bunch of wealthy people that actually it is possible to manage their affairs through a Zoom conversation. So um, it, is, it is very disproportionate the way that the pandemic has hit companies. I'm gonna, I'm gonna switch therefore to the, the second category and I'm gonna bring Bruno in, which is the strategic resilience piece, which is, you know, as we start looking to the future, we have to think differently about strategy. And we have to take very seriously the fact that we have no idea, for example, when lockdown is going to end. Um, Bruno, how do you in, in CINT think about uh, strategy right now? What sort of planning horizons are you using? What sort of tools are you using to help you with your strategy choices? Uh, Julian, as, as, a, as a company that uh, has been immersed trying to create digital platforms and products, uh, we're very used to the idea of unpredictability, right? So uh, uh, we, that's what we've been doing for 25 years is trying to create, you know, try to re rethink the business of our clients into the digital space. So we're always trying to recreate, you know, their value props or adapt business models into the digital space. And we learn that uh, the digital space is very unpredictable. So if you look at, you know, the failure rate, even the failure rate of the Googles and the Facebooks of the world, right, who are the, the giants in the space, and you imagine that they have all the resources, all the access to technology, everything, and how many products they launch out there that fail. And so, so what we learned in this uh, 25 years is actually that uh, even if you're a big brand, uh, you know, there's no guarantee that you're going to succeed when you're trying to innovate, to create something new in the digital space. Yeah. So what we learned, uh, I think that the main, and I love your slide around the, the, the detailed plans to, yeah. to the fog, right? So it's a, for, for us, it's a, it's a shift from robustness to resilience, right? So, to, so, so the, the, if you look at how we go about investing in anything new in, in big corporations, it's all about a thick, 60 page business case right so you have to prove like a mathematically how that return on investment is going to happen and then and this is not the, the way you go about you know uh, unpredictable uh, endeavor right so it's a in, in digital we learned very early that uh, there's the, the, those 60 page business case they they are completely useless for that for that environment right so it's a so the way the way we've been learning to do things is actually it's completely changed the way uh, we organize and, and structure investments. So that the, what we what what's been successful in this environment, and I think uh, there's some lessons there for for uh, for companies now trying to deal with unpredictability. 
the, the plants is, are, are much uh, thinner. <laughs> so they're, they're just stipulate uh, 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 overall goal, like this division. Uh, and then they open up for many different uh, strategies to get there, right? So instead of, well, let, let's just make it simple, like it's instead of one $20 million detailed plan, we're going to spend the same $20 million, but we will try many different things, right? So you, you, what do you see the Googles of the world uh, doing sometimes? Like they're you know, trying, trying even different strategies to, to solve the same problem. And people sometimes say, what, what, what product strategy is there? Like they, they have competing products. Yeah, sometimes they have competing products, but because they, they, they assume that they, they don't know which one's actually going to have to generate traction and actually touch the, the consumer's hearts and, and, and actually you know, uh, be successful. So it's a strategy of uh, trying to be like a, a venture capitalist of your own ideas. Like that's right. what we try to say. So like a, kind of a, a Kind of put your money, little money. In the end, we're going to spend the same twenty million dollars. But instead of one idea, one big idea, you're going to spend, you know, uh, yeah. put two hundred, a hundred thousand dollars in two hundred ideas, you know, and yeah. uh, and 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 you know, do round A's and round B's to the ones that are working and kill the ones that are not working. So kind yeah. of you select, your, you let the market select uh, what the best ideas are, and, and for that you have to change completely. Yeah. I mean, you organize and empower people inside. I do agree with that. I mean, the venture, we can learn a lot. We large companies can learn a lot from the venture capital industry in terms of not just of sequential investing, but also they, they've always, in my view, been very good at getting to the heart of the matter. You know, what is, what is the real risk here? What is the real opportunity? Let's just focus in on that and let's cut out all the other stuff. Ben, let me just bring you in now. Um, you know, you're a director of sort of insights and strategy. Um, what sort of tools are you using to try to project and plan for the future? Absolutely. It's it's really changed up the way we think about planning. So it's much more about scenarios at the moment with the uncertainty, We're trying to navigate through that fog. We're trying to look at most likely scenarios. So I think people might be familiar with the V, U and L shape recovery yeah. type models. So we're definitely starting with a base of that mm. and trying to think about it from a perspective of what could that mean in terms of market actions and impact and trying to reference as many different data sources as possible to try and triangulate what we think is most likely to narrow that range. So we're using those scenarios both as a point of what could happen, but also goalposts to then start plotting our planning around it. And that also means that we're really thinking about trigger points as well. So in our industry, it might be about reaching a certain level of consumer participation in something, or actually when things start reopening, when we start putting things back into the market both from a marketing communications as well as products. So that's yeah. becoming quite a different conversation that we're having with our bottling partners on how do we plan through this uncertainty and when's the right thing to do things as well. Um, right. right, good. Um, and Kareem, what are your thoughts on strategy and planning in, in Barclays? So I think, I think there's different elements. I mean, on the client side, I think it's very much about how do we embrace digital channels more so if we look at what we're doing now we're effectively in a test and learn phase that we've been forced into uh, and what we've been doing is engaging clients through means like this webinars client calls and so on which we haven't really done excessively before but the question is in our minds how do you continue these kind of digital conversations with your clients as well as complement that with the face-to-face -face interaction how do you then support those conversations further through bringing in more technology? So as an example, if we're trying to explain a complex financial solution over video, how do we embed technology that allows us to educate and explain to the client using visual aids, using advisors? Um, how do we um, do that? And it will be a work in progress for sure, but it's something we need to do to complement our business model. The second piece is people, clients have a lot of things on their mind just right now. It's not necessarily going to be their wealth. It could be their businesses. It could be their health. It could be a family member. And what that means is we have to think outside of the box of what kind of advice or information is relevant to them. So as an example, we had a client discussion where we invited an, an infectious disease specialist, something you wouldn't really expect a bank to do, but suddenly very, very relevant to our client base. And really, you know, that kind of conversation goes beyond wealth 
and starts to get into the realms of personal. And then strategically, as we look at our business model for colleagues, I think there's also an interesting component here around we've been able over time to remain productive despite being flexible. And the question then becomes, how do we further embrace giving our people more flexibility, whether that's working in different locations, whether that is thinking about your nine to five slightly differently to get the most out of people and allow them also to surround the clients with the right advice at the right time. Our client base is international. So just because we might be in the UK, for example, we actually have people all across the world, that doesn't necessarily mean working a, a nine to five makes sense. So there's a lot of things going on. I have to say, underneath all of this right now, we are in an environment where retaining your business is critical. Um, growth is a, a nice thing to have right now, but realistically in financial services, um, you know, that 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 is not gonna happen easily. I guess yeah. the last component is financial services has had a lot of discussion over the last few years about impact or ESG solutions, investments, and that remains topical throughout this crisis, if not more topical than ever. Now, I'm no expert on impact investing, but strategically, as we look at the industry and where it's heading to, it was always on a path where we were looking at more sustainable solutions for clients. But this environment only pushes that further when you think about the huge sense of community that's gripping all parts of the world, that translates into financial decisions and how do we invest for good? Good. I mean, there's a very important point I want to pick up on there, which is, you know, scenario planning by its nature, you know, is dealing with uncertainty. But there's two different types of sort of uncertainty. There are those where, you know, you know roughly where the world is heading, for example, towards greater sustainability. That is undeniably going to be happening anyway. And then there's the other sort of uncertainty where it really could go one way or the other. You know, when are we going to get some sort of vaccine? I mean, that could be, you know, in six months, it could be in six years. And when you do scenario planning, what you're trying to do is to sort of take a bet on the things which you know is, is roughly a direction of travel anyway, and then deliberately build option value on the things where you have no idea where they're going. And, and the concept I just want to make sure that everybody is familiar with um, is, is the concept of real options, which is you know, an investment in an activity where you have the right but not the obligation to, shall we say, build on that investment. And what, what that means essentially is, as you are planning for the future, um, you put some money into something which you know will have some option value in the future. I'll give you a very specific example of what I mean. In London Business School, guess what? You know, we've we're starting to teach digitally. Um, we've started doing that, you know, before, but we're really doing it properly into over the last two months. So any investments we make to build our digital capability and our knowledge of what consumers need in the digital market, any of those investments are good investments as long as we keep them to a sensible size, because regardless of where we go, those are going to be investments which we actually will be able to build upon. I don't, do any of you want to speak specifically to that real option point before we move on to the third? The uh, third uh, I, I would like to chime in there, Julian, because I think that the, the, the devil is in the details, right? So yeah. in, the, in, in, the, in the scenario, like it's very so it's it's really the size of the bets and the ability to you know to, to to pivot and you know and change that that's that that's what uh we think that uh traditional companies start to to fail in environments like this yeah. so it's like uh and even the selection of the the options like uh we see a tendency again to go back to robustness and you know and what's the likely oh this is the most likely option and then and suddenly all the others you know how many how much money the others are getting to actually, you know, to 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 actually have the chance of an option, right? So that's I mean, that's the. It's a terrific point, and let me just be very clear, right? Because we're all smart people. We can all make a case that what we want is a real option, right? Everything can be positioned as a real option, and so this approach does not, in any way, take away the job of the senior executives to make judgments on which of these small bets are worth putting money into, right? Because because just because it's a small amount of money doesn't mean we should do 300 of them. We should still figure out which five or 10 are the ones which are actually 
important. Can I move us to the third part? We can perhaps come back to some of this later, but, but the third part before we open up for questions, and by the way, dear audience, please continue to send your questions. I've seen about eight or nine so far, but please keep sending them in. Um, the third dimension we talked about was organizational behavioral or personal resilience, which is about how we as, as, as individuals are coping with this shock and this sustained period of working at home. What are your reflections on you know, the challenges and what you are doing to support your organizations in these difficult times? Um, Bruno, should, should we go to you again first and then we'll go to Karim and then to Ben? For, for, for me, I think I have a very particular vision on this. I think individuals are very resilient themselves. I, th I think organizations that we build are usually not resilient. So that's uh, <laughs> so that's my provocation there. Like uh, the, the the way we kind of organize ourselves and, and the you know hierarchy and, and kind of a stiffness, it just doesn't provide for that you know the resilience that we've been discussing here. So usually, so but there 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 are new methods and. Uh, but, but I'll open up to my colleagues here to for another uh, class. So, I mean, do you tell us a little bit about some of your approaches to organizing that essentially helps to make your organization, you know, as resilient as the humans within it? So, so when when you're organizing again for uncertainty, we what one thing that we we try to do if we're within ourselves and with our clients is actually try to organize. Uh, it's way more, way less prescriptive so it's a uh, it's multidisciplinary teams uh, that we can call tribes or communities that they kind of have one ambition one business goal which is usually a multi-year goal and they have a lot of freedom to how they get there right so again like uh, they have they may have many bets and many small projects uh, small ideas that it will that it will receive funding to get to this to that the, the, that true north that north star right so and it's a lot of empowerment. So we empower people that are, you know, closer to the client to make those decisions. So it's again, it's like a, it's less of a, the board at the board level you deciding which ideas are the good ones. It's actually kind of a, making a structure that uh, where that decision can make can, can be made in a much faster pace, closer to the action. Right. So so that's an organization that yeah. we believe that's way more resilient than than we than we usually. Of course, are. in today's environment, it is much easier for people to take autonomy because of course you know there's no boss literally kind of standing over them um what do you, just give us one practical tip if you like in terms of how you get the best out of you know trying to lead a bunch of people who are obviously working in their own homes you never see them what what are your what's your personal approach do you just give them a lot of a lot of freedom and, and get them to kind of tell you when they got problems or, or what uh, and, and, and the, the resilience, the resilience there. Like uh, one thing that we see changing in individuals when we put together this approach, is, is, is funny, right? So people say, "Oh, we want autonomy, right? We want autonomy." But but people are also very comfortable with their goals that they have today, right? So if you look at, look at anyone's scorecards today, where they have their bonuses attached, it's uh, it's very it's very prescribed, right? It's something that was def defined in the last budget session, right? So in November, October last year, and you know, it's then it usually it's like deliver, you know, initiative A by date C, right? So very prescribed. It, it doesn't fit with uh, with uh, that autonomy because what can you innovate and do if you already decided last year what you're going to do in 2020, right? So. Mm -hmm. But what, what, what we, in those type of organizations, we bring that uncertainty that is outside our doors, we, we bring to the individual level. Mm -hmm. like, the goal, your goal is this, you know, multi-year, very high level goal here. And, 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 and some, sometimes people have, you know, a sticker shock, like, whoa, really? Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, that's very lofty. I, yeah. uh, I, I, I don't know if I'm comfortable with that. In a, but that's that's the reality. So, but that's what actually the, the flip side is actually that's that's your empowerment. Well, just mm -hmm. you you can think of anything that actually can can get us there, right? Mm -hmm. so, 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 these, so, so, a, so this environment is very much sort of sh sorting the sheep from the goats, as we say in English. In other words, you know, who is actually stepping up and taking that responsibility? Who is who is clinging to some sort of traditional form of of, of management? Um, Kareem, let's go to you to ne next on this issue of you know. What you're doing within Barclays Private Bank to try to make sure you get you get the most resilience out of your people, helping them to cope. 
you know, so, so the big question that, that we and, and I certainly have on a day-to-day -day basis is how do I encourage my team and others to be as productive as possible? And what it comes down to is, you know, it, it's ironic. We're far away from our teams, but this is the closest we've needed to keep emotionally to mm -hmm. our teams. So by that, what do I mean? We've really had to understand people's personal situations. Uh, they might have children at home, elderly, you know, life doesn't just work the same way as it did two months ago. And so the more time I and other leaders take to understand people's personal situations, what's on their mind, mental health issues, what challenges do they face, the easier it is for me to unlock productivity. And the way we do that is once we understand the situation, we're able to come up with a collaborative work plan that works for the individual in question. You know, mm -hmm. I don't really personally mind if someone does their work at 9 a.m. or 9 p.m. It's really irrelevant in this situation. But what it effectively means is that we've crossed the boundary of professional and personal quite dramatically. And suddenly everything is about personal. But the more you familiarize yourselves with your teams, I think it really unlocks that potential to get more out of them. Of course, it's not going to be like it was at this time last year. There, this, there are certain things which are harder to do, but the more flexible we are, the better. The other interesting part is, you know, I work as part of a global organization. So we have offices obviously in the UK, but we also have offices in different parts of the world. Now, there's always been this perception that the UK is the hub, all the activity, all the action, all the decisions are taken in London. Suddenly, whether you're in London, whether you're in India, whether you're in Switzerland, wherever you are, you're all on the same footing. You're all not close to each other. And so one way as well we think about our organization and resilience is it allows us to bring everyone onto the same level playing field. And that means we're able to involve people from different locations mm -hmm. into decision making in a much more powerful way. You know, I used to sit around management team meetings where people who are on video in different locations are at a complete disadvantage. Right. That's gone away. Mm -hmm. And the question is, how do we even the level playing field further? Um, and again, it, you know, that will be challenging when we are back in the office. Indeed. For me, you know, what I'm doing on a day to day basis is having regular touch points with my peers, with management, with teams who work for me. Uh, and it's proving extremely effective. And I, I have to say there was a transition period, but it's it's the new normal. And now the question is, how do we continue it? Effective, but also exhausting. If if you're anything like me, you're working you know longer hours than ever. So Ben, absolutely. You're, you're, and then I'm going to open up for, for the for the Q and A. But Ben, some last thoughts on this? Yeah, absolutely. Actually, a lot of stuff that Krim just went through res resonated a lot with me. I guess that's the thing that we have with large companies but i guess what i'm observing is that it's much more focus on leadership providing that voice and that direction so totally agree with what bruno what you're saying is that locally we are devolving more into small cross-functional working groups and that's happening a lot but i'm also seeing there's still an importance of leaders providing a north star to help guide people and provide that i guess surety where you've got so much uncertainty happening with the rest of the market having a leader who's able to give that reassurance and to keep people focused on the right priorities is really helpful and i i think with leaders have providing that is really important to build that organizational resilience personally for me um, i have a team which works across europe so we are used to doing quite a lot of virtual chat but i found that because we're missing that face-to-face -face communication even if it used to happen less often than all being in the same office, it is important to maintain that somehow. And so that's meant I've had to invest more time in reaching out, doing informal chats via things like Zoom or Microsoft Teams, just to keep the conversation going. So my teams are definitely more empowered, but they still benefit from that soundboarding. They're not working in isolation. And so we just need to invest a bit differently through technology to enable that. I guess the last thing I'm recognizing recently is that there's a fatigue which comes after a certain period of time with working remotely like this. So I think for a lot of us being under lockdown, we've had nine or 10 weeks of it. And you start recognizing that people are starting to get a bit tired and you need to switch things up. And I think 
you need to recognise that in your organisation, have ways to deal with it, whether it means encouraging people to take a bit more time off, helping manage the hours, or even reducing the meetings. So there's yeah. things that, as organisations, we're learning as we're doing, but there's definitely techniques there. Perfect. Look, thank you. So we've got about 14, 15 minutes before we have to finish, uh, and they've got more, far more questions than we're going to have time to get to. So a lot of people are fascinated by the experimentation and learning approach that we've been talking a little bit about. Um, people are looking for some examples, and there was a very specific question. Do Barclays and Coca-Cola provide, to provide this sort of internal funding for fast reaction solutions? So, so just be as specific as you can about how you actually operationalize this test and learn experimentation real options approach. Um, who wants to go first uh, on that? Uh, I have a, a real example, and, and it's not about yeah. setting some money aside to do something else, right? So it's actually it's how you operate your core business, right? So I have a we have a client which is a big bank, it's a gigantic bank that we're just kind of a, their their whole digital channel operate like a they had the, the 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 approach that I was discussing here, right? So everybody had the project a project that would take two years, and so kind of a came in and say let's change completely this and they reorganize around one community cross-functional that can do everything like you have all the instead of the the functional departments you have everybody in one team and that team is actually decides what to do right? and they have a lot of flexibility so they have this true north we, the, we, what we need is we we need we have a goal to acquire five five million customers to the digital channels because it saves money to the bank instead of people going to the branches and calling the call center, they're using the, the internet banking or the mobile app, right? That's mm -hmm. the goal. We need 5 million new customers. Yeah. What, what? How we get there? Well, you guys figure it out. But yeah. just, you, you have the all power to do it. What? There's no, we're not going to discuss last year what the project we're going to do. You figure it out. And in this environment, for example, with this empowerment, people just figure out, hey, we'll, we'll create a new app, for example. They create a new app for people that were Older people that were not not comfortable with the the mobile app that they had, which is a kind of very small buttons, a lot of functions. People were just afraid of losing money, so they create like a think of a a mobile uh, like a, a banking app for kids. Big buttons, big fonts, very clear, super super simple. And guess what? They got like four million customers using the new app, right? Yeah. So, but but you see like that. So you give you give people the the autonomy. They create something out of it, but you see that like, if you limit, if you make their goal to the year, you have to improve the app. You have yeah. the, you know, to, to get 4.1 stars on, on, on the app store. Yeah. They will yeah. never be able to create something absolutely new that, that solved the, 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 the bigger problem. Yeah, good, thank you. Um, ben Karim, any specific examples of how your organizations are really taking this options, flexible investing approach? Ben, you seem to be... Nodding a bit. Yeah, I think it's not just because of the current crisis, but more generally, test and learn has definitely been an increasing mantra in my organization. We're a company built to scale. So if you think about Coca Cola, it's pretty much everywhere. You know, it doesn't matter what kind of retail store you go to, they sell Coca Cola. So it's been difficult for us because we've set up the scale and optimizing for that. But we've found a couple of ways where we've tried to build in that flexibility. From a communications perspective, we've been quite keen to test and trial quickly to new opportunities. So an example of that might have been um, a pop-up we did last year with Stranger Things. The guys put it together in under a month, which for us is pretty fast. Yeah. So working at how you can break processes and what you can do to go faster can be quite exciting at times. Another yeah. thing that we've looked at doing is for new product introduction, we've actually set up a, a set of people who sit slightly outside the organization. So you aren't necessarily constrained by old ways of doing things, um, which helps us move faster, test and trial, and not feeling like you have to be constrained by scale. Yeah. I mean, it is a terrific point that because of lockdown, and um, because of the urgency, we have, we have quickly, you know, being hugely creative in some of the organizational arrangements we use. And we've been, we've had a license essentially to get rid of many of the old processes. Certainly I've seen that at London Business School. And of course, you know, that is definitely some learning we want to be able to take with us as we, as we return to some sort of normality. Um, quick, quickly on this one, Kareem, anything else? Or do you want to, do you want to, we've got I, any more questions. I think just very quickly, you know, we talk about 
flexibility and funding. And of course, like any other organization, we've had to go through a reprioritization exercise um, in terms of that, that real option scenario. But there's, there's three other things I noted down that are relevant here. Um, the first is for financial services, in the last financial crisis, regulators really clamped down on banks. Mm. This time around, it's much more about a partnership. So how do we partner with regulators to enable us to make investments that can enable digital client interaction more easily? So where are regulators suddenly willing to change their stance where they weren't going to do that in the past? Um, they've become more of a friend than a big brother, let's say. The second piece is what kind of risk are we able to tolerate at an organizational level? So all of us here work for big corporations where audit trails, there's everything, but where can we relax our risk policies in order to get the right services, products, advice out to clients? And then you can invest to a certain extent and accelerate those investments, but without the necessary education, it's irrelevant. And so what we've had is really smart, successful campaigns of engaging clients who typically would use manual or face-to-face -face interactions to complete a process or a task and asking them to self-serve. Our typical you know, wealthy client is often 60 years old and above. They don't like necessarily to use digital channels. And when you add in cultural differences, that that's, makes it even worse. But suddenly we have that opportunity to make that real option pay off a little bit more risk-free, let's say. Got it. Thank you. So here's a question, a challenging, a couple of challenging questions coming up. How do you objectively tackle the dilemma of learning through multiple scenarios and the anxiety of delivering in the short term scalable successful solutions? So, you know, keeping the show on the road whilst also doing all this other th other stuff that is preparing for the future. Who wants to pick up that? Um, ben, we'll go to you first, maybe. Yeah, sure. Um, for me, the benefit of scenarios is that over time you increase your surety. So I, I look at the way we're approaching scenarios at the moment and you start focusing on what you're seeing as being the more realistic options. And then through that, you're able to narrow the goalposts of what you're aiming for. So I, th I think it's the fact that those scenarios are live rather than just having them as static. For planning for the short term, I think it comes back to that the options we're talking about to some extent. and putting more investment behind the things which you have more surety behind. Okay. I mean, one personal experience that I've had at London Business School is, is I mean, there's some uncertainty you can't resolve. Even if you can't resolve the uncertainty, you've got to give people a sense of when you're going to be making decisions, you know. So, you know, when are we going to decide, for example, when, um, you know, when the next MBA uh, start date will be whether it's online or virtual you know we we need to give the the, the the 800 people at london business school at least a date when we will decide even if we don't know what that decision will be because otherwise everybody just gets into the state of learned helplessness so um bruno anything on the um on this question of balancing the long term and the short term uh, I, i'm back to my argument before okay. like that, that that's okay. the the, 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 the amount, of, amount of resources is the same like i'm not advocating yeah. to put more money you know that it's just the it's just to invert your pyramid uh, get your money and spread it spread it across and, and, and be a vc to your money okay um actually i'm gonna in the interest of time Karim, if it's okay i'm gonna move to the next question and, and perhaps we'll start with you we would like to hear this great webinar somebody says we'd like to hear some words of, and more about more freedom versus training and preparation. In other words, how do you prepare your teams to have more accountability and freedom whilst continuing to develop high standards? You know, it's good to have this stuff, but what do you do to get these people prepared for it? Kareem, any thoughts on, on I mean, almost like personal development, professional development during lockdown? It's, it's a really good question. Um, and I think the key comes down to empowering and trust and allowing people to make mistakes. What we're finding is that some individuals in the organization are working nonstop, overly stretched. Uh, you know, the crisis throws up a lot of extra work. For others, their workflow has certainly decreased. And so the first step is identifying where are their pockets of capacity as well as pockets of stress. But then how do we 
empower people to try something new, take a risk and educate them on their way. And, and for me, we're still going through that process. It's too early to say, but what I can say is as a leader, the way we make this work is really by being more flexible in how we guide people. So it's really hard to educate people remotely over the phone. Uh, but what I've found is the more I increase and dial up my interaction, so my phone is ringing nonstop all day, day and night, the easier that becomes. But, you know, we have had to reprioritize and we have to accept that work won't be of the same quality always as before when we're stretching someone. But the long term gain is significant. I have junior graduates who are on my team who are looking at incredibly complex strategic you know decisions around expansion market growth looking at complex regulation looking at legal ramifications of decisions we might make and to be honest they've thrived with it by taking guidance at the right time but it's on me as well to be available literally anytime they want me to be available um, and I think it, I, I think it's an experiment in progress, honestly, Julian. Got it. So we are running out of questions. I've got time. I've got one more big question. Uh, one fun question, Bruno. Why is your map upside down behind you? It it is not upside down. It's exactly. Just a matter of perspective. You might let them know where you where you come from. <laughs> that's it's I'm, obvious. I'm, yeah, I'm originally from Brazil, so I, I'm from the South Hemisphere, and uh, that's uh, yeah. South. South doesn't mean down. We're we're yeah. uh, we're uh, we're a planet losing space, so there's no upside down space. It does it does remind you how insignificant Europe actually looks when you when you yes. when you do it that way. Um, okay, last question for all of you, um, and I think it's a good question to end on. Uh, as, are you anticipating a shift back towards your pre-pandemic model over time when things stabilize? Or are you sensing the new approach uh, will endure? And perhaps a quick, I'm going to ask for like 30 second answers from each of you on that one, if you could. Who wants to go uh, first, Ben? I'll go, go first. I'll go first. Yeah. Um, I'm, go I'm going to be difficult and say yes and no. So yeah. as Coca-Cola, the business doesn't fundamentally change, but consumer habits we are seeing evolve. So the way that we advertise, the way we speak to people through to being more cognizant of affordability and being economically affordable to people is going to be more important. And so we need to adapt our business to those things. Perfect. Thanks. Uh, Bruno? Well, we, we try to eat our own dog food and uh, what, what we're doing right now is you know, creating a ton of scenarios and, 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 and try to start what, uh, you know, what, what our options are, what the what we should be doing in small experiments that we should be testing uh, right. right now to prepare for the, the future. And in some ways you were, you're, you're saying pretty much, you know, you were already operating in a way which works for this new world uh, and the, the change has not been so much so dramatic for you, right? No, no, not at all. Yeah. Karim, you've had huge changes. I bet yeah. your clients are longing to meet you face to face again, right? I, I think there's two parts. I think you know, there's a question of do we need to have thousands of people in an office um, in order to deliver to our clients? And I think the answer is very definitely no, uh, when you look at how we're working today and still delivering. But the other key point is, and I think this will change dramatically because of the pandemic, how are we becoming more agile? So how are we going to keep this notion of making decisions more quickly? We've been forced to do that whether it's investments, whether it's how we serve clients, but we need to maintain that because that is a dramatic and positive change for our business model. Perfect. And let me just throw out one concept which some of you are familiar with. It's this notion of hysteresis, which starts in the world of, of, of physical science, but economists use it as a, as a means of saying, you know, sometimes when a shock lifts, actually the world does not go back to normal. And, and sometimes that happens in a very bad way, for example, you know, after a recession, un unemployment doesn't actually go back to, to pre-employment levels. But in fact, this notion of hysteresis applies across the board. In other words, what uh, across the different activities that we have, there are gonna be many cases where we take away the lockdown and we're gonna find sometimes to our horror, but sometimes to our delight, that a lot of these changes in behavior actually endure and of course our challenge as business leaders is to make sure we capitalize on the the most attractive of those changes in behavior and make sure that they stick apparently so, it takes 
six so you think so, so, again? You think, so you think people will be going to work on uh, on pajama pants right for now <laughs> Yeah, that's right. That would be fascinating, wouldn't it? To, to see if the changes in how we dress ourselves endure beyond, uh, beyond the lockdown. So they do say it takes about 66 days for a habit to become a habit. In other words, a change in behavior to perpetuate over time. And, you know, most of us are at about day 50 of lockdown. So we're going to definitely get to that 66 day point. OK, look, we are going to finish. We must finish on time. Thank you very much to Bruno and to Kareem and to Ben for your fascinating insights. Three very, very different industries. I hope you all enjoyed the fact that we're talking about such different experiences. Um, I appreciate you listening. Thank you very much for your questions. We will close now and we will certainly be in touch with all of you with a little bit of a follow-up information from this webinar. So with that, I will close and say thank you once again. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.